Good morning, dear saints, and blessed Easter. Welcome to Thy Strong Word. Today is Tuesday, April 16th, and you're listening to the program where each weekday morning we explore the holy scriptures to which God bespeaks us righteous and nourishes our faith. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo of St. John Lutheran Church here in Laverne, Minnesota. Actually, I say here in Laverne, but currently I'm traveling, so I'm coming to you from an undisclosed hotel here in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. But anyway, I'm eager to get into God's Word this morning, and today we are opening up Proverbs chapter 8. Solomon once again personifies wisdom, and he's personifying wisdom as a woman who is calling out to all of humanity. He emphasized wisdom's invaluable role in life, declaring her to be more precious than jewels and more profitable than silver or gold. Wisdom is portrayed as having been present at the creation of the world, working alongside God as a master craftsman. And her presence brings blessing and honor to those who embrace her, and she offers a path to prudence, knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. Well, whether you're listening to us over the air on AM 850 in St. Louis or live stream or on demand at KFUO.org or through the KFUO mobile app or maybe as a podcast, I'm just glad you're here. So settle in, open your hearts and your minds. We are about to begin. Thy Strong Word is graciously supported by the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. LHF translates, publishes, and distributes books that are Bible-based, Christ-centered, and Reformation-driven. So when you get time, visit them online at lhfmissions.org. That's lhfmissions with an S on the end, dot org. And if you have any comments or questions about today's show, you can email me at pastorboo at gmail.com. You can call into the studio, or you can find me on Facebook at Phil Boo. If you want to call in, that number is 800-730-2727. Well, joining us this morning to help us open up Proverbs chapter 8, it's the Reverend Doug Gribbenaw, pastor and mission advocate at KFUO Radio. Good morning, Pastor Gribbenaw, and welcome back to the program. Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for having me here today. It's a big week with our share coming up uh, in just, a, what, well, let's see, two days from now. <laughs> I was just going to bring up Sherathon. Unfortunately, you. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be on the air for Sherathon. I'm really kind of disappointed. I'm gonna have a guest host on Thursday and Friday. So uh you'll have uh, the Reverend David Boys Claire. He'll be leading the the ship here on Thy Strong Word during uh Sherathon. But it's also exciting Sherathon year, right? Because this year, KFUO turns 100, if I'm not mistaken. You are correct. We are coming up to our centennial celebration in December this year. So it, it's a big deal. And, of course, next year is going to be a big deal, too. So you'll want to tune in sure. for both share right? <laughs> well, so next year will be like the big 100th anniversary, It's our big party. This, this is suppose. the build-up to yeah. it, right? You know, And, and so we have issued a call uh, out to people here. You probably heard the, the, the promo just a minute ago to share your story. But, you know, anybody who's been involved with KFUO uh, over the last hundred years uh, and you have a wonderful story or just a, a wonderful memory of your time with KFUO or even a wonderful memory of you listening to KFUO, uh, maybe with your parents or maybe with your grandkids. We'd love to hear those stories and share those stories, uh, the impact that that this gospel proclamation over the airwaves and, and nowadays over the Internet uh, that impact that it's made in the world. So uh, I, I do hope that you'll you'll not shy away from using that talkback feature in our app uh, and and share those stories with us. We'd love to share it with the world. Yeah, folks, if you have an Android or an iPhone and you haven't downloaded the KFUO app, you, you might as well go ahead and do it. You're really missing out. <laughs> it's a very easy way to access a lot of the programming on KFUO. And just just to, so people don't that may not know, tell them a little bit about what that talkback feature is. It's a way for you to send us a message in your own voice uh, with the quality that actually makes for, for good broadcast. You know, kind of back in the day, you used to have to call up that telephone number and, uh, you know, leave the Christmas greeting or whatnot on, on your local radio station. Well, now you can do that right from the app with your with your smartphone. And uh, it's just so much more convenient. And you and you can do it anytime you'd like. 
Uh, so day or night, maybe you woke up at 2.30 in the morning and couldn't go to sleep because you were so excited about KFUO and, and, <laughs> and the study of Proverbs 8, right? <laughs> you knew it was coming. That's right. And you wanted to, to write a message or you know actually speak a message to KFUO. Uh, it, it's a really fun thing. So don't be shy, everyone. Uh, even, even us guests and hosts on KFUO, uh, we sit back and go, wow, is that what I sound like? So we all do that. Oh, oh, don't goodness. worry about it. <laughs> Oh yeah, I, I, I well, full disclosure, I still can't stand to hear myself, so <laughs> I definitely understand that. Well, I tell you what, um, folks at home, go ahead and put on your KFUO t-shirts and socks that you got from Sherathon last year. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get ready to dive into our text, and we're going to do that by having our guest, Pastor Gribbenall, lead us in a prayer. Would you do that for us, please? Of course, and let us pray, gracious Lord, heavenly Father, you created all things, you sustained all things. And you made man and woman to be the crowning jewel of all your creation. And in your great love, knew that your son would have to come to suffer and die for our sakes, to purchase and redeem us from sin, from death, from the power of the devil. Knowing all this, you yet made creation, sustained it. And as our scriptures tell us, for the love that was set before him, our Lord Jesus Christ, knowing you, joyfully endured the cross and its shame that we might be made in him heirs of salvation, heirs of the heavenly kingdom. Bless our study of your word this day that we may be edified and strengthened in body and soul unto the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. Well, the last two episodes, we have been dealing with the forbidden woman, the adulterous woman, with warnings against adultery, which I think are both practical and also broadly spiritual about being unfaithful to God in all kinds of ways. And we've been dwelling on that for a couple of episodes. And and frankly, we ended our episode yesterday with the words, Her house is the way to Sheol, going down to the chambers of death. Or as one commentator wrote, her house is on the highway to hell. (laughs) Um, (laughs) There we go. We've been we've been looking for maybe the uh, the other shoe to drop for some time. And and now basically we have that in chapter eight. Wisdom returns. Right. The alternative to foolishness, the alternative to adultery, uh, either literal or unfaithfulness against God. So we have the blessings of wisdom today. Now, the first little chunk is probably the first 11 verses, but I'm only going to read through verse 7. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version to get us started. Here we go. Does not wisdom call? Does not understanding raise her voice? On the heights beside the way, at the crossroads she takes her stand. Beside the gate, in the front of the town, at the entrance of the portals she cries aloud, To you, O men, I call, and my cry is to the children of man. O simple ones, learn prudence. O fools, learn sense. Hear, for I will speak noble things, and from my lips will come what is right. For my mouth will utter truth. Wickedness is an abomination to my lips. Now, she's going to keep on going in this same vein, but I wanted to pause there. Just to sort of juxtapose, we've been talking about how the adulterous woman, the forbidden woman, the stranger woman, how she is alluring people to basically come down those dark paths, uh, come at night, uh, come down the alleys, uh, walk by her way, which again is a highway to hell if we take those words. Here, wisdom, another woman, um, she's calling out not secretly – Not enticing people, but just basically standing in the middle of the streets saying, hey, what I have to offer is for everyone. And that is actually the the big difference between the two. Wisdom sits in the open in public and, and is exposed to everyone, issuing the call forth to all who may come by. And in fact, places herself in in the middle of where traffic goes. So so no one is to be missed, whereas the adulteress. The language is that she sort of stands on the corner, just off to the side. I, I had in my mind reading, uh, you know, up to Proverbs 8 here, uh, kind of like the, the trapdoor spiders, you know, just sort of laying in wait until the, the, the silly victim, the foolish one, right, is, is mm-hmm. wandering by and then snatches and pulls away. 
uh, out of the public view, out of the eye, you know, that road that leads to Sheol. But wisdom stands in the open. Uh, in, in truth, really exposing herself uh, to, to any and every person. And, uh, and wickedness will try to uh, overcome wisdom. The adulteress with envious eyes peers from the dark. Um, with you know, jealousy, I think it's really sort of the fundamental character of adulteress. That jealousy of, of, of really what wisdom can offer it is so much better and so much more enduring and indeed is life-giving as opposed to the the paltry baubles that the adulteress can offer as dressed up as they are and as enticing as they may seem to the to the flesh to the senses right to our our sinful flesh but in the light of day in the public sphere if you were putting both in the middle of that marketplace uh, there would be no comparison wisdom would outshine with well with the glory of Christ and I, and I and I love how she's really covering all of her ground, at least the way Solomon describes it. You know, we have the the heights beside the way, and I, I had to dig into that just a little bit. It's like, okay, what does that mean? Uh, basically, just the higher places alongside the road. So so as people are walking by, she's shouting down to them. And then of course the crossroads. We think of those busy intersections. You know, we we have folks who are. Uh, homeless and needy sometimes will gather at those intersections. Well, why do they? Well, because it's the most opportunity to run into the most people, I should say. It's an opportunity to run into the very most people, and that's what she's doing. She's standing there, but instead of asking, she's giving. She's saying, here, take this. It's free. Beside the gates in the front of the town, so as people enter the gates and at the entrance of the portal. So in two, three, four different directions, she's crying out. And and what I love about not the not only the fact that the seductive woman is sort of off on the side trying to lure you away. And she's only kind of looking out for the people who will follow after her. But wisdom is available to all people. To you, O men, I call, and my cry is to the children of man. Well, you know, not just males, obviously. Mankind is in view here. But then we, ha- we have, and I'm wondering if they're distinct, we have two different people that she refers to. Now, earlier we've heard that, you know, her the wisdom is for the wise, too. But in this case, it's the simple ones on the one side that they should learn prudence and the fools that they should learn sense. Do you see this as two separate groups or just maybe a poetic way of re, re saying the same thing? Well, I think there's a there's a there's always a sort of reflection, especially in this Hebrew poetry. And and we have these two sort of extremes and there can be a difference between a, a fool and a simple one. Uh, I think of the simple ones that just sort of take things at face value, and and they they go forth, you know, plotting those footsteps one after one after one, uh, just going in the direction. And in fact, actually, the the simple ones really probably is is a laudable one in the sense that we are called to become like children. Right? to trust God's word implicitly and to love it. It's, it's a simple faith in the sense that we know and trust. And so we learn that prudence, the prudence of continuing in that way. You know, there's another proverb that I, I think we've all heard, you know, uh, raise up a child, right, in the way he should mm-hmm. go. And when he go, becomes older, right, he will not depart from it. A sort of simple faith and the prudence of following and trusting in the Lord. A fool, I think, is more along the lines of, of what our modern society is like that is blown by whatever is popular. <laughs> mm-hmm, so think right. of the, the fool as sort of the social media addict, right? Whatever's popular, whatever's trending, they hop right on board. They go with whatever is happening along. And so the fool is to learn some sense, some discretion, if you will, uh, into what should be, what should be trusted and read and, and absorbed and brought within. And so it's really to encompass the whole spectrum of humanity. And we really could say, you know, well, what, what of the wise people, right? What of the, uh, the learned people in our age? Well, apart from God, we are not wise. We are not learned, right? The, the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord, right? And so here we have the whole of humanity, O men and O children of men, simple and fools. 
It's all of us brought in here entirely. We will hear a little later another sort of uh, paralleling. And it, it comes with the benefits of what wisdom does and how it is used by men when we hear of the rulers and the princes. Again, sort of trying to capture a whole spectrum of humanity. And so we have that here with, with this, uh, these, these fools and these simple ones. It is each and every one of us. The only other thing I think I would like to add to the understanding of fools, and it really does fit in with your description, is that it's, it's not only people who perhaps don't have access to the discretion and, and instruction that even the simple ones don't have but should learn, but the fools also kind of, unlike the simple, actively rebel against it. Amen. It, they, would rather, they would rather be uh, delighted sort of by hedonistic pursuits or human pursuits. They, they'd rather be – and I've talked about this before. It's kind of like the agnostics you know, the, who say, well, I don't really know if there's a God. I haven't really decided. Well, that seems like a pretty important thing to dedicate a little bit of time to. You know, <laughs> I mean, it's one thing to either believe or not believe. But if you're just like, ah, maybe, well, I don't know, take a minute and see if you can figure it out. Uh, and I think that's sort of the fool, the fool who says, I just don't even want to know uh, whether it's wisdom or, of course, God or whatever it is. And, and so we have from this lady wisdom. Um, her speaking noble truths here for I speak noble things and from my lips will come what is right from my mouth will utter truth and wickedness is and the word chosen here is abomination. We could have probably chosen repulsive, but basically makes her sick. <laughs> wickedness <laughs> is disgusting in the presence of 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 of, uh, of wisdom, which is why, as you said earlier, if if the adulterous woman and lady wisdom were competing openly then wisdom would win all the time because it would just show how gross and utter, utter uh, rebellious it is to go after the adulterous woman. And what she has is uh, things of exceeding beauty. And that's a sort of an, another way we can sort of render that, that noble, uh, that it has such a, a, a worth. And it's also related then to, to, um, to to leaders, to princes, uh, to to rulers of the world, uh, or to princely things, the 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 things that have enduring worth. And again, we sort of see this going to be reflected a little later into what this wisdom, these noble things, uh, create or enact in in the world. Again, coming back to those those kings and those princes. Uh, and which is not to exclude any of us not of, of blue blood, right? Not of noble birth. Mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of uh, really this understanding of vocation, of those who are to be put in a place of authority to care for, to look for, to do what is right, to, to embody these noble things that we are given from only one place. And that is from, from wisdom. And, you know, wisdom is true. Wickedness is an abomination. And I'm going to add a few more verses here. And what we're going to see is that in comparison to the adulterous woman, and just being more broadly speaking, in comparison to all temptation to sin, there's always deception involved. Whether it's your old self rationalizing, whether it's Satan himself uh, trying to trick you, but whatever, it, whatever the source of the temptation uh, your desire to fall into it is often being misled, but rather wisdom speaks plainly, straight up, doesn't try to uh, do backflips over to convince you. It's just it is what it is. We're going to read verses 8 through 11. All the words of my mouth are righteous, and there is nothing twisted or crooked in them. They are all straight to him who understands and right to those who find knowledge. Take my instruction instead of silver and knowledge rather than gold, for wisdom is better than jewels, and all that you may desire cannot compare with her. So pausing again. So, so yeah, I mean, we, we heard the adulterous woman. She, she looks nice. She smells nice. She's nice to look at, and well, she has smooth words. Yeah, in fact, you I, know, I, but, I missed a, uh, a reference that I had that goes back actually to, to Proverbs 5. And it's it's a beautiful parallel, you know, that that we could hear with the the lips that speak noble things, right? The, mm -hmm. From my lips come what is right, from my mouth will utter truth, or I abhor right wickedness, right? 
If we go back into Proverbs 5, in verse 3, we have the description of the lips of the adulteress. The lips of a forbidden woman drip honey, her speech smoother than oil. And then, of course, the fool might be enticed by this to find, in the end, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp Mm -hmm. as a two-edged sword. Because there's a deception, there's a crookedness to that. And instead, with wisdom, there's nothing twisted or crooked in them. It is straight, there is no deception, it is truth, plain, and laid forth. And in fact, really, that's speaking of the, the one who inspires Holy Scripture, right? The, the Holy Spirit, who is the author of all of God's special revelation here, the divine revelation. Even the ugly things that took place in the actual history of mankind has been laid out there, plain. There is no deception, no effort to hide and cover things up. We have the full truth, you know, <laughs> the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God, is in Holy Scripture. So there's there's nothing crooked it's all laid out there, good and bad and indifferent, uh, because it is, it is you know, God's own truth, quite literally. <laughs> and how often when the truth is proclaimed in its simplest and most basic form, the language is simple to understand, that we, I guess according to our sinful natures, tend to try to twist it every which way for it to mean not what it just plainly says. I mean, there are certainly cases throughout Scripture where it's necessary that we do some interpretation. It's written in a language that isn't our natural language. It is uh, uh, set in times that we may not fully understand. It's written to people and by people that it's important for us to know what was going on. But at the end of the day, much of Scripture is very plain, especially once it does get interpreted through the proper lenses. And yet so many people say, well, that doesn't really apply anymore. Well, Paul was a bigot. That's why he wrote that. That part isn't God's word. So many ways in which we try to, um, frankly, even take plain wisdom and and twist it so that we don't have to be accountable to it. But the Bible's very clear here that says that when wisdom is out there being proclaimed, these aren't trick questions. It isn't esoteric knowledge. You don't have to have some sort of secret seer stones to understand. She's in the middle of the city square just talking normally. And, you know, if, if <laughs> I have two little ones at home, right? Seven-year-old who's almost going to be eight, four-and-a-half-year-old who's almost five. And in truth, you know, the, it comes down to that question of why. <laughs> why? Mm-hmm. Why? And often I find with my kids the why is not so much the question as much as the response to, I don't want to do that, or I don't think it's fair, or I don't like that, so I'm going to challenge it and say, why? Why? We do the same thing with God's word, right? And it is a double-edged sword. You know, the, God's law strikes us. It hurts us. It, it, it kills us. And we don't like that. The old Adam says, uh-uh, that's not fair. <laughs> that's not what yeah. I want. I want this other thing. I want this adulteress over here. So why? Well, why shouldn't I go with her? Oh, you're giving me, well, why is that the reason? And, and the old Adam loves to play that why game until he can t- twist the scripture. It might work with mom and dads because eventually you have to go <laughs> to because I said so. <laughs> right. right. But Holy Scripture, that inexhaustible fount of, of wisdom, you, if you keep pushing that why and you are, are, are honest in your engagement with word, you will never get to the final, well, just because God said so. Because Scripture will always answer that why. It will always say why. Mm-hmm. The why, the why, the why. Now, you can sometimes ask the wrong question, right? But that's sort of cheating the game. That's not being honest in your engagement with the word. The why is not just because St. Paul said so, because St. Paul will tell you why. You know, it's not that he's a bigot. It's that it's in the word, and he will point you to it. And the chief, the, the best tool to engage the scripture, especially when it isn't clear, is to engage the rest of scripture, to have scripture mm, right. interpret scripture, right? The, the things that are difficult for us to understand and grasp and wrap our heads around. Well, there are other parts of scripture that address this and do so in with, with, with clarity. And so it's, it's important even more so, uh, I think, that than, than ever. We have a soundbite culture. And I think in a lot of ways we have a soundbite view of holy scripture. Everyone has their couple of verses that they love. And sort of their hobby horses. 
And in fact, pastors can fall into that as well. Yeah, we, mm-hmm. we end up leaning into this one verse that we just love. And, and, you know, we really need to take the whole of Scripture and not just rely on the simple ones that we like, just, you know, one or two or five, but to, to keep with that, the whole counsel of God, to further our understanding and knowledge, even of those favorite verses that we love, right? To get that further and deeper understanding, to gain that wisdom that, that, is, that is offered freely to you and I in Holy Scripture. Well, we're getting ready to head into a break. And so I don't want to go to the next section just yet, but I want to give you uh, two minutes of homework. And here it is. I'm talking to my guest, here it is. <laughs> homework. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask the question, um, why do you think that we had the we have Lady Wisdom, we have the adulterous woman, we're getting ready to have Lady Folly tomorrow? Why are both the antagonist and the protagonist why are they all women? I'm I'm curious about your thoughts about that. But like I said, I'm going to give you a break to think about it. So, folks, we are right up against our time, so we're going to go to break. Don't go anywhere. When we come back, Pastor Gribben on. I will keep on going through Proverbs chapter eight. See you on the other side. These are the voices of young Lutherans in Mexico City, children who are excited to learn more about their Savior, Jesus. But they need our help, because good Lutheran books for kids in the Spanish language are in short supply in Mexico. To learn how you can help tell Spanish-speaking kids everywhere about Jesus in a language they can understand, go to the Lutheran Heritage Foundation website at lhfmissions.org forward slash Juan 316. Welcome back to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo. With me today, it's the Reverend Doug Gribbenaw, pastor and mission advocate there at KFUO Radio. Don't forget that you can contact me at pastorboo at gmail.com. You can find me on Facebook or call into the studio with your questions, comments, complaints, concerns, whatever you want to talk about, as long as it has to do with Proverbs 8. And that number is 1-800-730-2727. All right, brother, we kind of brought this up when Lady Wisdom was first personified, and we kind of waffled on, well, the word for wisdom there is feminine, so maybe that's it. Maybe it's like a ship. Uh, is, is that the case with the rest of them? Uh, it just seems like all of the, uh, all of the personifications are, wis- are, are female. I, I, maybe there's nothing to read in, but what do you think? I have to say, that, well, in, in terms of the plain understanding, right? <laughs> We're talking mm. about the simple truths. We in in English, we, we don't have an inflected language, and and this was something that was new to me as I engaged with uh, with Greek and with and with Hebrew uh, in seminary. And yes, I took Spanish in high school. I wasn't very good at it. I, I took German in college. I wasn't very good at it. So the, the whole gendered inflection thing w- went over my head. <laughs> but I finally started to see it in the original languages of Scripture. English doesn't have that. A cup is a cup is a cup. A table is a table is a table. But in these inflected languages, elements within creation are, are either male or female or, or they're neuter, right? And I, I think it, the one holdover in our English perspective of things is, you know, uh, that ships are, are ladies, right? A, a big Star mm-hmm. Trek fan, right? Captain Kirk, you know. Oh, you know the Enterprise. You know she's a beautiful gal, right? So ships are That's ladies. Right. You know, it's not in English. You know, you, you wouldn't just say, "Oh, yeah, of course, a ship is a lady." But in an inflected language, aspects and words have an inherent uh, sort of gender, right? And mm-hmm. that dictates the way in which they are declined, and, and, and not not as in refused, but as in they go through the different cases of the language, nominative, dative. Dative, genitive, accusative, things like that. And so you, when you're looking through the words, the beauty of an inflected language is you can be absolutely certain what's connected to what. Yeah, because the, the endings match, the genders match, you know, these things are brought together. 
So I, I, I say the first blush of this is wisdom's a lady, and, and just by the language, and that's the way that that uh, that she is talked about. Um, mm-hmm. But um, you know, the other the other thing is that the gender of of a certain word or thing uh, is not um, it doesn't govern the reality of what is behind it. Right, so we, we we talk about you know that that we are you know the the body of Christ. We are the church, and the church is His bride. Well, there's a whole bunch of us who are dudes in the church, right? A whole bunch of us that are ladies, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> but together, collectively, right. we, we are the bride of Christ, because it's not it's not driven in this view of of uh, of male and female in this regard, but in the view of our relationship, right? Of of really of marriage, right? Marriage of man and woman, as Scripture tells us, and as practical reality shows us as well, because you need a you need a man, you need a woman to have children of men, right? But but it's that the greater image is Christ and His bride, the Church. That's marriage. That's union, right? That is our our intimate communion with God, right? And human male and female marriage is is you know an an, an echo or. A, for lack of a better word, a derivative of that, right? It's it's drawn from that, which I see here is is also why we have wisdom and and her opponent would be the one who violates, who breaks and destroys marriage, and that is the adulteress. It's our relationship with God and our living in this marriage with God, which is why wisdom and the adulteress are put here together. And, and so, simple answer, because you ask a simple question, a pastor gives you five minutes. Um, <laughs> I see the the language deriving a bit of the gender, right? That's that's I think chiefly where this comes from. But if we scratch a little bit below the surface, I I would I would look to that relationship of God and man, right, as a marriage, right? And so, you know, He is the head of the house, and we are His spouse, right? So we sort of take on a a feminine role. Now, um, that's all to be aside because the the reality of what we need to look at is is you know who is behind this, right? And that is God, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and His relationship with us, the crowning jewel of His creation. That's my take in seven and a half well, minutes. I like right? it. <laughs> yeah, so. There you go. No, no, no. I like it. I like it. You know, I, I think there are. I, you're absolutely right. I think it reflects both the language. It reflects our relationship with God. I think it also fits in with the uh, with the the uh, the foil that's on here, which is a father delivering messages to his son. So it would make sense in that regard to have the opposite gender be that which um, both draws away and 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 maybe even has truth. That is, that is um, who his yeah, son I, I would engage there's... with. That's correct. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I don't think there's too much to read into it, and it's not like it's negative against women because both the positive and the negative are there. Right? Absolutely. But I, I bring it up because sometimes that's the critical reading of the Bible, and so I just know that there are people out there that might be thinking it, and it's always worth bringing up. Mm-hmm. Now, the next thing we're going to have to struggle with in these following verses is hatred. You oh know, goodness. people tell their kids, <laughs> you're, you're never to hate anything. You just say you don't like it. Um, I When I was – when I first joined the Lutheran Church, actually, I was a young man um, coming out of college, and I said, oh, yeah, I, oh, gosh, I hate that. And and this little 80-year-old woman said, no, don't say you hate it. Say you don't care for it. <laughs> it's a very and, polite uh, so, way of expressing your dislike. This is – that's true. Yeah, so for <laughs> since then, since then, that's exactly what I say. I say, well, I don't really care for that or whatever. Um, but anyway, this verse uh, challenges us a little bit in that regard. Verses 12 through 17. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence, and I find knowledge and discretion. The fear of Yahweh is hatred of evil, pride and arrogance and the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. I have counsel and sound wisdom. I have insight. I have strength. By me, kings reign and rulers decree what is just. By me, princes rule and nobles, all who govern justly. I love those who love me and those who seek me diligently find me. So, yeah, Psalm 97, 10 says, oh, you who love Yahweh, hate evil. <laughs> and, and that's what we're being told here, too, it seems. Um, so to hate evil is a is a righteous thing. I mean, there is something that we should hate. 
There are indeed, and but it has to be governed by, by the Lord, by His Word, and what and by what He has declared. This is an abomination. These things I hate, because you see, we we have a tendency of maybe taking things too far, right? Sometimes you know something happens in the church, right? And and you're just you're angry, right? You're angry, and and so. In our fallen nature, we're like, it's righteous anger. It doesn't matter that I'm cursing and swearing and throwing things. Ah, I'm, I'm just so over-the-top angry. Uh, it's righteous anger, so you can't tell me not to. I need to. You can't tell me to calm down. Righteous anger. Well, mm. we don't have uh, the, the kind of discipline <laughs> that, that, that God himself has. And so we have to always temper and control our our human hatred, our human anger, um, by his word, right? We have to judge according to the rules by which he judges, right? It's not for us not to judge, right? We should be discerning. We should learn prudence and discretion and to say these things are bad, uh, but not just because I said so myself or not just because I don't care for it, right? (laughs) But because the Lord has said this is bad. These are the things that the Lord hates, and he hates them because they're injurious. They hurt his creation. They hurt his people. They hurt me, and he loves me. And so we always have to keep ourselves from, from just you know letting the old Adam run wild with excuses and keep that restraint of what is to be hated, the things that the Lord hates, and why is it that he hates them? Because God is love. And that's the weird thing, right? We have this world and culture that says, well, if you tell someone they can't do this or you don't affirm them or you're not you know, loving them for who they are, that you hate them. But that's not the truth. When we are, are captive to the word of God and we say, this is not good, what you're doing is bad, what you're doing is evil, it is not because we hate them, but quite honestly, because we love them. That God has loved us mm-hmm. and we love our neighbor. And it, it does, it hurts them, though they may not see it, right? The, the words might be, you know, dripping with honey, right? And the, and the wonderful scent of the, the couch of the adulteress. But no, we know because the Lord has shown it to us. Wisdom has revealed this is bad. It is to be avoided, it is to be hated because it is, because it is hurts. It hurts you. And God loves you so much that he takes all the darts and arrows, <laughs> and all the hatred of the world. You're not letting me do what I want to do. I hate you. And, and, and you know, the Lord <laughs> grabs us naughty children and wraps us in his arms, and we beat and pound against his breast with every uh, wicked thing we can say, hopefully until we get it out of our system <laughs> and can hear his words of actual, actual gospel that say, I love you. And this is why I'm protecting you. And so what I hear you saying is that, of course, we're called to love that which God loves and hate that which God hates. But because of our natural sinful tendencies, it probably isn't the right motivation if we were to make whips and run people out of the, the narthex for selling something. It has to be. I don't think that know, would play out too well for, uh, yeah, for basically, any of us. Basically, basically. <laughs> Jesus could get away with it because he's God and he is doing it completely righteously. Absolutely. God can hate in a completely righteous and just way. Um, but I still think it speaks to us, and I'm sure you would agree about you know our dispositions toward things. We certainly should we certainly shouldn't be embracing and loving those things that God finds uh, objectionable or an abomination. Um, but but also it's important because there are behaviors, there are sins that people engage in that are clearly detailed in the scriptures as being hated by God and an abomination. But it's worth saying again that that is the behavior, it's the sin, but the person who is caught up in that is still someone for whom Christ died. They are not our enemies. They are people that are are really we're to go out and reach out to. So even if you find someone's sin to be more egregious than your own, um, that's not the place for righteous indignation or hate. It's the time to share what Christ has done for them. The challenge we have in in the modern culture, um, especially with the, with this, you know, the, the transgenderism movement and this, this sort of gender identity is that uh, sin 
and the adulteress has has tempted these these human beings and to the point where their identity who they are is so wrapped up in that sin that when we speak against the sin it does feel to them that we are speaking against their their person who they are their very identity and i remember during seminary uh, a, a wonderful bit of wisdom curate dreyer you know we were discussing how to how to counsel and to work with um, homosexuals and those with with you know gender attractions that are uh, mm-hmm. contrary to god's word and i remember the one thing he said to me he said you know the first thing i would say to them is who are you what is your identity because if we can sort of deceit sin from being who you are that's everything about right. you back to who are you you were you were knit in the womb by the hand of god you are his beloved creation that's that's your identity you're a human being a wonderful treasure in god's eye all the sin around it that's that's not who you are so it's important for us to to maybe consider that as well uh, to you know sit on the other side and say what mm-hmm. what is the what is the great roadblock for us to speak god's truth in love and usually it's it's a communication error right <laughs> and so yeah. it's always important that, to use god's word as what he says and to and to address the question beneath the question well, I have wholeheartedly bought into the necessity to d- properly distinguish between law and gospel. Amen. At the same time, I think that identity, we get caught up in this too, because you have folks out there that are, that, that's who they are. They're identifying with their sin. And and I don't want to belabor the point because we don't, we have several more verses to get through. But at, at the same time, you know, we Lutherans speak often about being simul justus epicator, saint and sinner at the same time. And and that is a correct theological way to describe our condition. But I think sometimes we make that our identity. And, and we kind of like, well, oh, well, I'm sinning. I guess I'm a sinner as well as a saint. <laughs> I, I think that's just the natural human tendency. It's it a cheap is grace true. idea. And that's why St. Paul was like, you know, well, should we just keep on sinning so that grace may abound? <laughs> I mean, the Holy Spirit sees and knows us better than we know ourselves. You know, that that whole idea of like, well, if I, I'll give God more opportunity to forgive me and show his great <laughs> love. I'll just sit a whole bunch more. And St. Paul's like, nope, put a stop to that. That's bad that's thinking. Right. Don't do this. <laughs> Well, and I, and I love, too, how it's described as wisdom being something that people seek after, diligently find. And, and, and just before that, you know, by me, kings reign and rulers decree what is just. By me, princes rules and all nobles, all who govern justly. So just as there is a lady wisdom and a lady folly, just as there is a simple and foolish and wise, you know, there are just and foolish uh, leaders, kings, uh, authorities. Uh, but we see here that to be a just ruler is to rule by this wisdom, this wisdom of God. But because it's available to everybody, I think this is sort of an indicator of how even unbelieving kings can still do God's will, of course, because God is working that will in them for the good of his creation. Wisdom is open to everybody. I think, frankly, even to unbelievers, they don't appreciate it in the same way, but it's what ends up being called common sense. Absolutely. And and even our Lord uh, before Pilate said, you know, you would have no authority if it had not been given to you from above. Right. And, and recognizing that Pilate did have authority in that place. Right. And he was ruling. Mm-hmm. But, but yeah, he, he didn't rule justly in this case. <laughs> right. No. He's fine. No. I wash my hands of you. Nah, it doesn't work that way, guy. <laughs> you know? But thanks be to God that our Lord Jesus Christ did go to the cross and rose again from the dead so that even these uh, follies may be forgiven as well. In the following verses, one might think that it's this is a prosperity gospel message because it speaks of a riches and honor. But I think we'll take a little deeper look and find that that's not the case. This is verses 18 through 21. Wisdom continues, riches and honor are with me, enduring wealth and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, even fine gold, and my yield than choice silver. I walk in the way of righteousness, in the paths of justice, granting an inheritance to those who love me and filling their treasuries. I'm getting the distinct suspicion that wisdom here, Solomon, through this caricature of wisdom, is not really talking about cash. I think he's talking about some other treasures. What do you think? The things that endure. 
you know, the treasures right. up in heaven, right? Where moth cannot, uh, you know, corrupt and destroy it, where thieves cannot break in. Things that are of better and more enduring worth than than the created world, than riches of gold or even fine gold or silver. Seek the treasures in heaven, right? Seek the treasures that endure forever. For we know that, that this, this whole creation is going to go away. The new heaven and the new earth are coming when our Lord returns and his second coming, right? And, uh, and so to, you know, don't store up for yourself the baubles of the earth, but look to the true riches. And those are found in wisdom, which is to say it's found in God. So I'm going to read the next section of verses. This is going to be all the way through 31. It's a big chunk, but this is also a really intriguing text about the role of wisdom. I think we have to keep in mind that it's Solomon who's personifying it, but the role of wisdom being present at creation. Here we go. Verse 22, Yahweh possessed me at the beginning of his work, at the, at the first of his acts of old. Ages ago I was set up at the first, before the beginning of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water. Before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills, I was brought forth. Before he had made the earth with its fields or the first of the dust of the world. When he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep. When he made firm the skies above. When he established the fountains of the deep. When he assigned to the sea its limit so that the waters might not transgress his command. When he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him like a master workman, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world, and delighting in the children of man. It's the end of verse 31. All right, so, I, you know, I cannot help but connect this to Job, right? Job is questioning God, and he literally says, God, in response, after a lot of uh, complaining, finally says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Where were you when I uh, set the limits on the seas? Where were you when the springs of the deep? Well, Job wasn't there, but apparently wisdom was. <laughs> what does this mean? Well, in, and even in Job chapter 28, behold the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. Oh, and to right, turn right. away from evil is understanding. You know, uh, Job has some wonderful treasures. It's a great book. It's often an overlooked, I think, but we really ought to do it. But, you know, as I'm, as I'm hearing you read this, I, you know, I'm taken back again to, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Or, if you want to go with the Christological uh, view of Genesis chapter 1, we turn to Genesis <clears throat> In the new chapter of John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. We have wisdom, lady wisdom, here mm -hmm. now standing in the place of, of the second person of the Trinity, our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the, the source of wisdom, right? He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. No one comes to God. And that, and that knowledge, uh, that wisdom, that inheritance, right? And, and we find life only in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, also in this section, some of the church fathers have, have seen uh, in wisdom here uh, an allusion to the Holy Spirit as well, you know, looking to the third person of the Trinity. And I, and I think in a, in, a, in a way we do see that, and we can see that, especially remembering that, you know, the, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son together, going forth as well. Uh, and so the... Uh, Irenaeus, one of the early church fathers, right? He he's he sort of said, you know, I think wisdom here in Proverbs eight that that's probably the Holy Spirit. Um, but the majority opinion, if you will, to use a sort of legal phrase, uh, Ignatius, uh, Justin Martyr, Reverend Martin Luther, uh, they they say yeah, wisdom here is is the second person of the Trinity, you know, our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And I, and I love how it puts it through in, in that whole view of creation, right? That uh, the Lord possessed me at the beginning of his work. You know, that, that he was with me there. And, and possess is to, is to have within, right? We even have an allusion to that, that mystery of the Trinity, one in essence, and yet three divine distinct persons, right? And, and to be possessed, fully possessed, fully engaged, uh, the fullness of the Godhead, right? I will have to say that in verse 22, it's one of those words that has been um, perhaps recklessly translated, best construction, sometimes yeah. as I created. Was, I was going to say, right? say, I was just about to bring that up, or fathered. Uh, and, and, and yet the actual, the actual Hebrew word itself really is, is this idea of possession. And, and, and yeah, it's, it, it's, it takes a linguistic gymnastics to go back to that Hebrew and say, well, it could convey sort of a sense of creatingness, but it's such a, a quite honestly, it's such a, a, a mental gymnastic weak exercise in, in the original Hebrew. It really comes to this best translation of sort of possessing, to be within. I think, yeah, just to add to that, I, you know, it's created in the Greek Septuagint. And, and, and my thoughts about that is simply um, an, an honest sort of translational kind of error. I mean, you said haphazard, and that's, I think that's what you said. But still, that's, that's, that's what it is. You know, they're talking about creation. Mm-hmm. And if you're thinking just very first level person, okay, he had, he had a wisdom. God created everything, so he created wisdom. But I see wisdom being portrayed here as always having existed, even before the foundations of the earth. He was with him at the beginning of his work, not he created him at the first, like the first thing. I know it says the first of his acts of old, but that word too is his way of old, the first of his ways. Before so, time or space were even created, right? Because <laughs> I mean, right. those are creations of God as well. Yeah. So that's why I agree with you. I connect it to the divine, mm-hmm. whether it's the Holy Spirit or the 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 second person of the Godhead uh, who became Christ. Either way, it's God. And that, and that's, and that's you know, it's always been, always will be. It undergirds the foundation of the world, which is frankly why even in those cultures where they do not acknowledge the true God and perhaps have never even had access to the word, um, because of this law, wisdom written on their hearts, they still tend to follow the way God has set things up to be. And, you know, in verse 23, ages ago, I was set up, right? I was, I was, I was established. I was anointed. I was appointed, right? You know, Psalm 2, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill, right? So there's always this sort of appointing. And so I think that lends weight and credence to this being the second person of the Trinity. You know, before the foundations of the world, Christ was crucified, right? This was always the plan of salvation. This was always how God was going to do this before, you know, uh, before the beginning of the earth, he was established, right, uh, when there were no depths. And, and it really, it, it mirrors Genesis chapter 1 so well, uh, as well as John, uh, the Gospel of St. John chapter 1, too. Yeah. I know we have a couple well, we of verses. Five, I, I know we've got five minutes. <laughs> yes. Or we say we have, we have five verses in four minutes. So let's get, we'll, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. So verse 32. And now, O sons, listen to me. Blessed are those who keep my ways. Hear instruction and be wise. Do not neglect it. Blessed is the one who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting beside my doors. Whoever finds me finds life and obtains favor from Yahweh. But he who fails to find me injures himself, and all who hate me love death. You know, whoever fails to find me injures himself. Um, you know, going back to the, the personification here, she's standing out in the middle of the streets calling. You can't miss her. So if you're failing to find her, that's your own fault. That's what I'm reading. It, it, in, indeed, it, it, it has been made plain to us, right? As St. Paul says, you know, plain to us, you know, the law written in our hearts, plain to us in the creation of the world. Um, you know, his divine attributes, his majesty in the things that God has created, it is evident, it is fully there. You know, St. Paul says, we're, you're, you're not, you don't have an excuse. You are without excuse. You can't just claim ignorance because the evidence is fully around you. It surrounds you. It, it, and in fact, it permeates you. All of these creative things. So if you fail to to find and see this, if you really, if you just are like you said, the the fool who just fails to even give a hoot and, and even bother with it, you know, just chasing after the baubles of the world, the gold and the silver, and eh, these other things, whatever. Well, that's that's on you. Uh, it's not. You know, I remember the the view of Revelation, right? You know, the the sheep and the goats. 
You know, and the Lord said, you know, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness, to the place that was prepared for the devil and his angels. Not because Christ's uh, sacrifice on the cross is insufficient for them, because they've rejected his forgiveness and the life that he offers and says, I will find it my own way. I will not seek after you. I will seek on, on my own. And, and they go to the place where they were never intended to be. Hell was for the devil and his angels, but not for the sons of man. That's right. Uh, and and we, we choose to go there if we reject the Lord's Christ, if we reject the salvation that is a free gift that is offered there in the middle of the street for everyone to have. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, the rest that passes all of creation, right? I'd like to thank my guest this morning, the Reverend Doug Gribbenaw. He's a pastor and mission advocate at KFEO Radio. Pastor, thanks for being on the show again. Thanks for having me here. God's blessings to all of you, brothers and sisters. Folks, come back tomorrow and Pastor David Boys Claire will be with us and we'll together tackle Chapter 9, where that new woman is introduced, Lady, Lady Folly. Pardon me. Solomon continues the personification of wisdom, but then contrasts her with Lady Folly. We'll be getting into that and a lot more. As I already said, I'll be gone on Thursday and Friday, but I'm pretty sure that Pastor David Boys Claire is going to be our guest host. So I'm excited to have him on board and I'm appreciative to him. Okay, well, that's it. So until tomorrow, may God's peace and blessings be with you all. As we pray, Father, keep us in thy strong word.